Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to another Strange Parts show and tell. How's everybody doing on this fine Saturday morning slash evening slash wherever you are? I guess it's afternoon for me. So you'd have to be in like Hawaii for it still to be morning. Hey, Skate Rat. Thank you for moderating today. Everybody give a sh shout out to Skate Rat for helping me run the show here from behind the scenes. Hey, Alternator 3000. Hey, Mil... Milky? There's a lot of numbers in there. Hey, Oren. Hey, Rambling Geek. Hey, Socko. Good to see you. Hey, Dreams are Fragile. Hey, DJ Marlis. Let's give a shout out to DJ Marlis, too, for helping run the show here as a mod, keeping everything moving along and copacetic. I'm drinking some, uh, some Lion's Mane tea this morning. Didn't get quite enough sleep last night. I did get my hot tub working though, which was an all all afternoon night affair. Not what I expected to spend the time doing, but it's what happened. It's a long story. It was a necessity instead of shooting. Uh, hello, hello. Hey, quick and dirty from Germany. Welcome, welcome. Hello, hello. Hey, triple halt. Glad you're here. We are going to show your thing today. I promise. It's in the list. We've got it in the. In the slide deck, we're trying something new where mods can uh, easily feed me images um, uh, via via Google Slides of all things. Um, so yeah, we're going to try that out. We, the technology and sort of infrastructure for running um, this live stream is totally different than the live streams I ran in the past. Um, huge shout out to to DJ Marlis in particular, but all the mods for helping me get uh, figure out what to do and, and get set up. So that we can have guests and so that we can run it all within a web browser. Um, I'm really, I am using OBS still, but only really lightly just because my camera doesn't like talking to the web browser. So um, I'm using virtual cam there. But um, we're, we're kind of, it's still rough around the edges. We're still figuring out all of the pieces, um, the, all the things that you can do through OBS. Um, and the reason for this is, is a couple fold. Um, it, it's mainly around me traveling. So I want to be able to have a lightweight setup I can run from a, a web browser when I'm traveling. Um, but also, I want the ability to have other people host if I'm not able to um, because of travel or if I get sick or whatever. Um, you know, my goal is really for this to be uh, as much a community event as uh, as me. Um, you know, I really want all of you to be, um, you know, uh, uh, part, in, uh, part of the show and, and stars of the show. So, um, so I want it to be able to run even when I'm not here. Um, and so, you know, we're still figuring some things out. Um, uh, you know, being able to show images is a big one. Um, we're trying to figure out how to do notifications and stuff. So um, just uh, letting you know what's going on there. Let's see. Let me bring up the right channel here. Um, just making sure, I, making sure I have my back channel here to the mods. So is, am I in focus? I think I am. Yeah, that looks good. Hey, Pascal boy. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Hey, Triple Halt. All projects are welcome here. It doesn't have to be, you know, the greatest thing ever to be a cool project. Um, so, uh, you know, even if, if something's half finished or, you know, it's just a little hack or something, all good. All welcome. So, glad to have you here. Um, let's see. Do have any questions from the audience? Yes, exactly, Sako. It can be literally anything fun. Anything you think this audience would be into. Finished, unfinished. Electronics, not electronics. I mean, trying to keep it somewhat geeky, but you know, it, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't have to be electronics. Um trying to see what I have to show and tell. I got a little bit of a, a rushed start to getting set up here, so I don't have anything immediately in front of me, but I do have a couple things. So we'll find something. Find something good. And we got a couple people queued up. It looks like uh, we've got uh, Ayush um, is working on getting their camera running. And yeah. the text overlay is mirrored. I have not worked on my keyboard. I've been working on a couple projects for videos that are kicking my butt <laughs> a couple iphone things so i have a plan forward but oh boy is it stressing me out so i need to get a, a video out the door um and i don't have anything that's close so 
Oh, yeah. Um, there was a sub that went through and the text was mirrored for it. Oh, interesting. I don't know. I don't know how that's happening. Um, oh, maybe on OBS. Aha. I have alerts turned on. Okay. So this is actually a good time to talk about this. Um, if you would like to support Strange Parts, the best way to do that is through the Patreon, not Twitch subs. Um, Twitch takes 50% of all of the revenue that all of the money that you guys donate through subs um, and bits and everything else. And Patreon takes only 10%. So, um, you know, you kind of get, if your goal is to support me on Strange Parts, um, the you get double the bang for your buck supporting on Patreon. So, um, yeah, here's the link. Um, patreon.com slash strange parts and uh, go there. It starts at $5 a month. Um, you get all sorts of awesome behind the scenes uh, stuff, um, early edits to videos. Uh, um, what else at the $5 level? Uh, early access to videos, um, polls, and the ability to suggest like what video do I work on next? Um, sneak peeks of projects that I haven't announced yet. Um, and then uh, at the $15 and $30 level, you can get either a t-shirt or a hoodie um, and you get access to all of like my CAD files and design files for all of my projects. Um, and at the $30 level, you get credited in a really special way in a Strange Parts video. So um, that's my quick Patreon pitch. Uh, that money is going towards salaries of people that I'm hiring. So it's not even going to me. It's going to people to help me make more videos, which I, I suspect all of you want um, if you watch my videos. So um, I very much want to be making more videos. So anyway, that's the quick pitch. If you'd like to support, I, I'd love it. Um, uh, it. It really goes a long way. Um, and it it makes it a lot less stressful to be hiring people right now, um, to, to know that there is money there to pay them no matter what, um, even if a video takes a little bit longer or a sponsor falls through or something like that. So um, yeah. Awesome. Um, looks like we got Nightbot in here working. Um, if we only have a couple people signed up for show and tell here. So um, if you would like to sign up, you can go to strangeparts.com slash show and tell. Um, we'd love to have you. And again, it can be super low key. Um, you can be on camera. You can have your face on camera. You can have your project on camera. You can be not on camera at all and just send me a quick description and some photos uh, or video of what you got. And um, yeah, we'll talk about it. So um, we'd love to have you. Um, it looks like Ayush might be ready. Um, can either Ayush give me a thumbs up on camera or a mod? Give me a holler. I got a thumbs up. Okay. I'll let you reframe and we'll add you to the stream here. All right. Hey, Ayush. Is it Ayush or Ayush? Hey. Uh, Ayush. Ayush. Welcome to yeah. Strange Park Show and Tell. What do you have for us? Hi. Yeah. So I have an ESP32 module here that nice. is connected via the internet and that I have awesome. running in my home server. But like I have it port forwarded. So like anyone can control the lights here. So oh. this is a blue light and this is a green light. Awesome. I usually do keep wanna... these like at my door. Okay. So like you can see. A certain lights can indicate certain things. Yeah. Like like what uh, but, typically uh, do you use to you indicate with those? What typically do you use it? For? Uh, yeah, so like uh I use the green light to indicate whether I'm in a meeting. So and okay. the blue light to indicate whether my video video's on. When what's on? My, my video. Video. Oh your video. So okay, like, yeah, uh, yeah. So the background. Yep. Nice. Yeah. So so nobody but, walks but, into your uh, shot. Yeah, exactly. But nice. today I have a demo, so like you can control awesome. it anywhere remotely using a link that I've pre prepared. Awesome. Do you want to throw that in the chat? We'll throw it up on screen here. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, what would I send it? I just put it in the in the Twitch chat, or you can put it in private chat on on Restream. Uh, okay. Either way, whatever's easiest. Literally anywhere a mod or I can see it, and we'll, we'll make sure it goes to the right place. If y'all haven't played with ESP32s, they are magical. You can run, you can program them like you would an Arduino. Yeah, I sent the link. Okay, awesome. All right, let's get that up. Oops. Can a mod put that up on screen for us? 
Um, ESP32 is our magic. You can program them using an Arduino interface, and they they act very much like an Arduino, but they have Wi-Fi built in, which is awesome. And Blue, Bluetooth, too, on an ESP32, right? Do you know? Yeah, so right now, someone just clicked the button, and the lights turned on. Awesome. Currently, it's yeah, only so uh, HTTP. I couldn't manage to get HTTPS on it. Yeah. Since it's just DSP. Yeah. But that's something I'm planning on doing in the future. Nice. Awesome. This is a cool little hack. So you put this outside your door? Yeah, I stick it on. Right? The, like this breadboard here has a sticker. So I just stick it oh, on yeah. the door. Mm -hmm. And like, Perfect. Uh, this will give instructions. So, like, the blue light can say I'm in the meeting. And they're green, like yeah. can see whether I have the video on. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Skabrat is asking, how long did it take you to get this working? Yeah, uh, getting products is the one that took the time, like the most time. Yeah. But setting it up took like took one or two hours, like of research and finding it out. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. Yeah, one or two hours. Is this your first time working yeah. with uh with an ESP? Yeah, actually, yeah, this is the first time. I've been, uh, I'm awesome. thinking of getting into servos and Arduinos uh -huh. later. Like, I have an yeah, Arduino, awesome. but like, need more, uh, like, things to uh, connect it with. Yeah. What are you running on the ESP32? Did you program it through Arduino or through like MicroPython or? Yeah, uh, through the Arduino IDE. Yeah. Using an awesome. uh, program. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, the the yeah. Arduino should be a pretty drop-in replacement um, for the ESP. So it shouldn't be any harder to work with than the ESP. It just won't have Wi-Fi. The problem with the Arduino is it doesn't have the Wi-Fi module. That's the only difference. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, Max is Max Max Crow nineteen is asking, how difficult would you say this is? Your, I think this is one of the most e more easy product projects to do with the ESP thirty two. There's certainly yeah. much more difficult stuff you can do with it, like more complex stuff. For sure, for sure. How would you say, like, how difficult is this in general, though? Like, out of not just do within Arduino stuff, but like for someone who's never done this before, how hard do you think this is to get up and run? I uh, I found it easy to online? learn. Yep. Like how, learning how to control with the Arduino, especially if you have like prior tech knowledge. But even without it, like you can find a good course, and like you can do it very easily. Yeah, that's kind of my experience too. Is I think, I think there are really yeah. good tutorials online, and if you have the parts and you're willing to kind of experiment and and fail or struggle a little bit, the parts is... are cheap too. Like if you get yes. them China. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, this is what maybe twenty dollars worth of parts at most. 15? I think ten. Like all of these two. Ten. Yep, that's awesome. Yeah. Are you based? Um, where? What country are you in? Uh, I'm from Qatar. It's a small uh, okay. place in the Middle Qatar. East. Yeah, I've yeah, been. I so did a video there. You can't get Amazon here, and like yep. delivery takes a lot of time. That's the yep. like main thing that delayed this project. Yep. Yep. I know the struggles. <laughs> I have I have the struggles even getting stuff okay. from China to the U.S. sometimes. So, and uh, yeah, as as you said, um, yeah. the the. Often the thing that takes the longest is just getting the parts. You know, it it uh, even in the U.S. it it really can take time. So yeah, That's it's just the shipping time. Exactly. Yeah. Are you in Doha or somewhere else in Qatar? No, I'm in Qatar. Whoop! You're breaking up. You there? I lost you for a minute there. Make sure it's not me. Oh, you there? Now you're back, I think. Maybe? Yeah, I'm there. You're... Okay. Yeah, you were. Uh, sorry, say again where you're from because you broke up. Hello. Yep, go ahead. Yep, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, I'm in Vakra. I'm based in Vakra. It's a bit south of Vakra. Doha. Okay. okay. Okay, awesome. I don't know. You probably have seen my Falcon Market video that I did in Doha. Have you seen that on the channel? Yeah, there probably is. Awesome. 
Awesome, awesome. Hopefully, I re Hello, represented Kingdom. Qatari culture well. I, I tried hard. Yes, I think there's just a strong delay. Are you there? Can you hear me? I think we might have lost you here. Yeah, I can. It's just this is okay. this is strong delay. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Well, let's let's wrap things up. This is awesome, Ayush. Thank you for for sharing this with us, and it's uh, it's Thanks. great to have a Qatari on the stream. And uh, yeah, hope to see Thanks. you uh, in Discord and and in the chat here on Twitch. Sure. Thanks. Take care. I'll see you later. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Ayush. Um, I know it took us a couple of weeks to get you on uh, show and tell here, and uh, really appreciate it. So um, yeah, sorry the connection was a little bit bad there towards the end, but um, yeah, um, really glad to have you here. And and uh, yeah, it's awesome to have. I I bet you got up in the middle of the night for this, and I really appreciate it. So um, yeah, uh, let's see. We've got. Um, few comments here um, relating to this. Uh, Rambling Geek says, ESP32s are amazing. I have one powering my, uh, monitoring my power usage to HA. What's HA? Is that a monitoring system? I know it's high availability, but is that, am I thinking the right thing here? Um, oh, Home Assistant, got it. Home Assistant is um, a system that I'm using here in the shop too. Uh, it runs on Raspberry Pi and it's sort of like a, a home automation thing. It's not quite a replacement for like Alexa, um, but it can kind of manage a bunch of uh, home automation devices. So um, definitely recommended. Uh, yeah, I run it on a Raspberry Pi. That little red dot right there is Home Assistant. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess the latest ESP32s have support for Thread and Zigbee? That's interesting. I don't know exactly what Thread is. Is that just threads or is that something special? Um, Zigbee is a um, wireless protocol similar to like Bluetooth, but it's I think it's much longer range and lower power. Somebody else probably knows better than I do. Um, let me chat here. And I'm not sure what Thread is. Red. ESP32. It is an IP-based mesh networking protocol. Got it. That is very cool. I'll have to play with those. That's exciting. Um, because those open a lot of possibilities for you know, like longer range communication, lower power communication, communicating with other devices. So that's really rad. Um, awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Rambling Geek. Um I have not tried using the Pi Pico wireless. I thought they didn't have wireless. Am I getting that wrong? We're talking the little, what are they, the RP 2040s or whatever, 4020s, the little like gumstick ones that came out semi recently. I haven't, yeah, I haven't really played with that. Um, oh, Pi Pico W has wireless. Okay. Oh, Thread might be the follow-up to Zigbee pushed by Google and other big companies. That's cool. Also, um, sounds like they're working on adding voice to Home Assistant. So that's awesome. Um, Laura is another, Laura Wan is another um, long range, uh, I think, Long range is even in the name, Laura. I think it's long range, in fact, is Laura. Uh, another wireless protocol. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's a great solution for remote monitoring. Uh, and in fact, I think, isn't the Helium like crypto mining network, Laura? I think it is. I think there is a, a network available that you can pay using crypto to get low bit rate internet access anywhere. Um, my neighbor is actually running a LoRa base station last time I heard. Um, so that's pretty rad. Um, yeah, Helium is LoRa. It's stupid. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I mean, I'd be curious to hear more about that. At first glance, it seems like a cool idea. 
I don't think you're going to make a ton of money doing it, but I like the idea that it's kind of a grassroots connectivity network that doesn't rely on cell towers, right? The cell companies charge way, way too much money for, um, you know, like, like, uh, IOT device data access. Um, and so I love the idea that it can be community run instead. Um, but I'm sure there are implementation issues. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't crypto. So 2020, I mean, yeah, like this feels like one of those situations where crypto might actually be a little bit useful, but I'm not sure that this hype around, uh, helium is, uh, particularly useful. Um, the helium coins were so expensive for data. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought it was really cheap because they're not pushing much money through the network. I know that. So maybe speculation is really screwing that up. Um, it, it seems like one of the few tokens that is actually useful for something right now beyond just sort of just straight up exchange of currency and um, that you shouldn't be speculating using it. But I understand how people might be. Um, yeah. Let's see. Have I ever thought of a phone, an iPhone with an on-screen fingerprint unlock? Um, not in depth. Uh, it sounds like something that's really hard and would require uh, extensive integration into the display itself. Um, let me grab that. I have a display sitting somewhere here. It's not attached to something. I thought I did, but I don't know that I do. Um, I'm sure I could dig one up, but uh, the sensor would have, I don't know enough about how those work. I think the sensor has to be pretty integrated into the display stack up. Uh, and it's pretty gnarly stuff. Um, you know, as we had a discussion in the Discord the other day, which um, if you're not a member of the Discord, you should definitely come join us. Uh, that's the link to join. Um, but uh, there really aren't very many actual like LCD or OLED manufacturers in the world. You know, it's sort of like there aren't that many chip fabs in the world. Um, it's it's actually very similar um, in the sense that you need, and it, it's very similar processes even, I believe, uh, but you need a lot of, um, a lot of infrastructure that's very expensive. You need a very large building or multiple buildings uh, and so it's just not economical for there to be that many in the world. Um, you know, it's, it's more about centralizing it on, uh, you know, a few companies, um, just got notified that my, uh, bit rate is dropping here. So let me just check my internet connection real quick because I'm up in the mountains. Uh, and unfortunately I don't have an easy way to show you, but I can see a 13,000 foot peak right out this window right here. Um, that's like. It's, it's very, very close, Mount Rosalie. And um, uh, because I'm up here, I have redundant wireless internet connections. So I have one that's terrestrial and one that's up to orbit. Um, so I have Starlink and then I have a point to point wireless through a local uh, ISP. Um, but it looks like I'm as good as I can be. So I don't know why that bit rate is dropping, um, but we'll keep running with it here. Um, so yeah, have just going back to this question, like, have I thought about this? Not seriously. Um, maybe I'm missing something, but it, but I don't see an angle that an individual like me could tackle that with. Um, and also like the fingerprint stuff is like heavily, like there's a lot of crypto on it that it, I just don't have a starting point for integrating with. It's all like integrated into their secure enclave and like, cryptographically paired between the fingerprint reader and the logic board. And like that, that is a hard place to play um, and be successful. So, um, yeah. Uh, apparently I'm a bad influence. So Mad Viper says, I need to tell you, you're a bad influence on me. I'm setting up my own place and working on things myself. So you're a bad influence. I now have a lot of tools doing construction works myself. So thank you for that. Um, you're welcome slash I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I don't think anybody should, uh, I'll, I'll never apologize sincerely for 
for inspiring someone to uh, buy tools and set up a workspace and um, work on making stuff more. Um, it, it, it's uh, I love it, and um, I think everybody should should have that experience. So um, sorry, not sorry. Uh, I'm glad I'm glad I've inspired you, and you're uh, you're out doing stuff. That's awesome. Um, awesome concept with Shontel. Thank you, Bot Denher. Uh, if you'd like to show something off, we'd love to have you. Um, the the goal of this, or the original goal anyway, was really just to uh, try and revitalize the Discord community. Um, you know, with <coughs> with me getting a concussion and not streaming anymore, um, uh, Discord's just gotten quieter. And so we know that it was really vibrant back when I was streaming a lot. And so this is an attempt to uh, to do that. It sort of morphed over the past month, let's say, since we're a month or two since we started talking about it. Um, originally, we were going to do it inside of Discord. Uh, and um, for a variety of reasons, that doesn't seem possible right now to do with um, this large an audience. Uh, there are some limits uh, within Discord. So, um, so anyway, we're doing it here on Twitch. And this is fun, too. So um, so glad to have you all. And, uh, and um, considering moving, either moving or adding YouTube. Um, as a streaming destination. Uh, it would be curious to see if, um, I'd be curious to see a poll, actually. Can a mod put up a poll? I don't have an easy way to put up a poll in here. Maybe there's a bot command, but I don't remember what it is. Uh, to put up a quick poll of like, would you prefer watching this on YouTube or Twitch? Uh, I'm just kind of curious. Um, while we're getting that up, um, Fox Programmer says, can we have a Mountain View cam? And yeah, I absolutely should get that going. I really need to work on the streaming setup um, more. Uh, I just, I've been busy. I've been trying to get a video out the door here. So, um, but hopefully we can get, uh, I guess I can't see a poll on here. Let me uh, pull up the Twitch interface. I'm just looking at the restream interface right now. So, Let's see if I can log in and everything. Finally made the switch over to one password after last passes. Uh, um, security problems. Okay, mute this tab here. Okay, let's see. Channel, I think. And mod view. Is that what I want? No. Though that will work. Did we successfully put up a poll mods here? Sako says, uh, in before some geoguesser genius finds Scotty's location to within 10 decimal places. Yeah, please don't do that. Um, I am, yeah, don't, don't do that. Um, also don't show up to people's places. I don't know that any of you would do that, but it's totally not cool to show up to a, to a streamer or a, a video creator's place, um, just in case that needs to be said. Uh, and unfortunately, if you do play the game of where is Scotty, that might lead to someone trying to do that. Um, and so it's not a very fun game for me. So, yeah. Um, oh, apparently only I can post a, a poll. Let's see. Let me see if I can nope, do that. How do I post a poll? Does anybody know? Um, okay, wait, hang on. This shouldn't be this hard. Shout out to the mods, by the way. Uh, we have... Uh, Oh, we have DJ Marlis and Scape right here. I saw four and I thought we had people I hadn't shouted out yet, but it's uh, two bots as well. It's Restream Bot and Night Bot. So shout out to the bots too, um, but mostly shout out to the mods. Uh, let me see if I can get into my streamer interface here, see if that's any better. Creator dashboard. Stream manager. Here we go. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, manage a poll. All right. Create a new poll. Um, would you, you have a choice? Would you rather 
watch strange art show. Oh, can't be that long. Would you rather watch show and tell on YouTube or Twitch? Uh, um, let's run it for a minute. Go. All right. Oh, slash poll. Okay, cool. Um, so Kaz Traz says just use Restream and VM both. We are using Restream. Um, it's mainly just a question of like, should I also turn on YouTube? Um, so yeah, and Sako is pointing out that this is a very biased sample. So I get it, but I'm curious. I'm curious how many people are here against their will, <laughs> against their will on Twitch. So yeah. Um, yeah. Would I get a different result if I was streaming on YouTube? Yes, of course. I'm just kind of curious. All right, view results. Okay, <laughs> bias is unexpected, but 23% would rather watch it on YouTube, which is significant. So it's probably enough that we should work on getting that set up. So maybe for next time. Um, um, you are allowed to cross stream now, um, even if you're partnered on Twitch. I believe that just changed in the past like couple months. So I also kind of don't care if they give me a hard time, then we can have a broader conversation. Uh, about how they treat their streamers. Uh, the only reason we're still on Twitch is just because this is what I've used in the past. Um, uh, and I originally chose Twitch uh, because, well, for two reasons. Um, partly because it's a platform that's designed for live streaming first, um, whereas YouTube live streaming feels a bit more like an afterthought, though I know they're working on it. Uh, and and it's changed a lot since I made that first decision a couple of years ago. Um, but also, like... I thought that it would be good to diversify um, places that I put up video. Uh, and what I didn't realize is how poorly Twitch treats their streamers. So yeah. Um, yeah, let's see. Can I make videos about ML with embedded systems like TF Lite? I don't know a lot about that, um, and I'm not a huge ML expert. I am a, a software engineer um, uh, by formal training, and um, you know it was my job prior to doing this. Um, but uh, and I'm a decent one, if I can say so myself. But uh, I've not experimented much with ML or TF Lite, so um, I don't know. I, I'd have to look into it more um, and see if it's really something that would be a good fit for Strange Parts. I I do want to do more programming stuff on Strange Parts, partly just because I'm it's it's one of my strengths, um, but uh, I gotta find gotta find the right thing. Um, <laughs> Akira suggests that I also stream for t on TikTok, and I, I should consider that. Like I have forty thousand followers at least on on TikTok. Might have grown since then. Um, yeah, um, strange parts on TikTok. If you're not following me there, I've been I've been playing around with seamless loops, which has been fun because it's turned into trolling the like auto restorers and customizers and repairers um, with these perfect loops of like removing bolts that they just, apparently I didn't struggle enough. Um, uh, the reality is those loops are like, we spend a long time in post cleaning them up and making them look perfect. So there are parts that are sped up and stuff. So it, it might look a little bit easier than it should. Um, and then I do a little bit of magic to make the loop perfect. Um, but uh, nothing that I think is against the spirit of realism is my hope anyway um and those have been doing pretty well getting lots of views so i've been having fun with that um do you have any tips on how to learn fusion 360 as a pure newbie um for basic shapoko work type cnc work not hardcore robotics design or anything um that's a good question uh it's a great question in fact i'm actually teaching someone right now who's not who doesn't have 
like a CAD background or particularly te technical background, uh, a friend, um, how to use Fusion 360. And I think the most important thing with Fusion 360 in particular, but I think probably most CAD programs is to learn the concepts that they want you to use. So you have to, you have to learn to think like the program wants you to think about your design. Um, and if you can do that, you can learn the tool itself pretty quickly, right? Like I sort of separate, you know, the idea of like, how do I think in my head before I start drawing something? How is it going to assemble together? What tools am I going to use to create the shape that I want? And in what order am I going to use them, right? Which is probably the, one of the most important things about being good at CAD. Learning the actual tool, learning how to create a circle or do an extrusion, that's, I think, less important and is easier to learn. So I would start from, you know, like Fusion 360, I would start from the concepts, right? And and find, a, I don't have a great reference. Um, I wish I could like say, oh, go watch this tutorial or something. But concepts like sketches, which are 2D drawings, um, you know, and, and concepts like constraints within sketches. So you draw a bunch of lines. You're making me want to do a Fusion 360 tutorial right now, which is probably not the best thing. Um, but you draw some shapes and then you can add constraints. Like, you know, from here to here should be this distance or this should be parallel to this or whatever. Um, you know, that would be a concept. And then you use these 2D sketches and operations like extrusion, which is just, just basically pulling uh, a drawing, a profile out in a direction, right? Um, those are the types of concepts that you need to learn. I, I would argue that you need to learn those relatively early. I didn't, and I really struggled for a long time with Fusion 360. So, um, but I, I do really like it. So um, I think it's a good choice. Um, Mons, if you can help me clear out the starred, uh, the starred questions, that would be awesome. Uh, Sako says, um, for Fusion 360, I would suggest finding a simple looking object and try and recreate that using the various functions. Um, most things start off as a 2D shape that you extrude. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I think that's a good learning point. Um, but yeah, I would see if you can find a video or an article or something that kind of gives more of a conceptual overview before you focus on, okay, how do I navigate the tool? Um, and I, I mean, I think that even goes for things like PCB design, right? Um, PCB tutorial or PCB tools are notoriously hard to use just from a tool perspective. Uh, but if you can learn some of the key concepts of like, oh, you start with a schematic and then the schematic gets, you know, you, you, you know, footprints, which are like the actual physical shape of the, of the um, pads where the, where the component should sit, right? Uh, traces, trace width, you know, um, layers of the board vias, like if you can learn those sorts of things, um, you know, uh, validation rules, uh, des design validation rules, um, uh, what a bomb is, right? If you can learn those things, then navigating the tool gets easier. Oh, I still wouldn't say that Eagle or KiCad are particularly easy to use. I will give a shout out to Flux. Flux.ai um, uh, is a new up and coming PCB tool that is all web-based and it looks quite cool. So I've been talking with those folks um, uh, and I'm very excited um, to see where that tool goes. Uh, all in browser, multiplayer, you can work on the same design at once. Um, it's it's uh, very like um, open source and sharing friendly. So you can make like, oh, this is like my little like, um, you know, power sub circuit. And I can use that in other designs, right? And if I update it here, I can update it across designs and stuff. Very cool stuff. So um, shout out to them. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so interesting tutorials about cart, cart conception. I'm not sure what you mean by cart conception and PCB design. Um, sounds like you're saying I should make tutorials. I'm not sure that's my jam, but yeah. Um, awesome. <laughs> Bot Denhart says, just learn OpenSCAD, much easier. Uh, OpenSCAD is a like a programmatic interface to modeling things. And I would 
yeah, it's not easier. Um, it's different. Um, it can be powerful, but I have found it to be much more of a struggle for anything complex. So, yeah. Um, Kira asks, uh, would it be easier or harder to redo your project of adding an audio jack to an iPhone 14? Um, it's a good question. Um, I have looked inside an iPhone 14 recently. Uh, I don't know. I think maybe easier because at least on the US iPhones, there is space where the SIM card used to be. And really, like, the hardest thing with adding an audio jack, particularly now that I've done it once um, successfully, is not the electrical side. It's actually the mechanical side of, like, where do you put the thing? So, um, yeah, probably easier, I would say. But there are other exciting things to be working on. Stuff just off camera that I can't talk about yet. Um, yeah. Let's see. Sakwins gave you a are uh, suggesting learning technical drawings by hand. Um, I have actually experimented a bit with, um, not with like CAD drawings or like blueprints um, or engineering drawings, but with more like industrial design drawings uh, and um, just learning how to do that. Um, maybe we can pull up some industrial, maybe a mod can pull up some industrial design drawings like uh, you know, sketches with, uh, you know, markers and, and pens. Um, uh, some examples, we'll try out this, uh, this slide share thing we've got going on here. Um, but yeah, and the goal there really was to try and make it easier for me to communicate what I have in my head to other people. And I don't know, I would say I've gotten better at it. I wouldn't say I'm good. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's um, it's it's a thing. Um, it's hard drawing by hand is hard. I uh, I got an iPad. It must be downstairs, which I got, originally got for drawing, and it's it's really pretty neat. You can you can draw in perspective, um, like you can get perspective assist uh, or isometric or whatever you want. Um, in uh, what am I using? Um, Procreate. Um, and I've got an Apple Pencil, and that's pretty awesome um, for someone who has struggled a lot to to get good at perspective drawing. Um, to you know, it's one thing to like understand the concept, and it's another thing. It's like, it's like playing pool. Uh, I can understand the concept of where I'm supposed to hit the ball. Hitting the ball in that spot is a whole different ball game. Uh, and so I think the Procreate stuff helps a lot with that. Of like, you still have to understand some perspective, but you don't have to be able to make your hand do the perfect thing. Um, so that's been really nice and, and, um, I've used that a lot. Um, but, uh, here we go. Here's some, uh, awesome industrial drawing examples. This is perfect. Uh, and so I would love to be able to do this kind of thing for sort of sketching out products or, or, you know, project ideas or things like that. And, and I'm, I'm not quite at this level yet, but, um, I've worked on my, worked on my arrows and, and things, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, no, I'm not at that level. So, uh. Yeah, fun. Um, do you think it is valuable towards CAD because it doing this kind of thing? Let me pull it up again. Like you really have to think about how about the actual shape of something, right? Um, I happen to have a an iPhone shell sitting in front of me here, and like I have to actually think about okay, so this is actually a rectangle, and it's got curves here, but it's also got like a slight rounded corner here and a rounded corner here. And so you have to sort of think about like, how is this thing made? And, you know, and it's got a bump here and that's got rounded corners, which are probably the same radius, but maybe not. And it's got these circles that are raised, right? And so whether you're doing CAD or whether you're doing technical drawing, you know, in 2D, you really just have to think hard about how is this thing actually put together? What primitives is it made out of? And again, you can see all these construction lines. Um, I don't think I can actually point. No, no you can see my cursor. 
Um, it's got all these like construction lines here, which is actually how they kind of figured out the surface and they're kind of communicating what the surface looks like with through those lines as well. So, um, you know, there's, there's a uh, method to the madness here. Um, also bonus points to whoever uh, found this image, <laughs> a perfect, perfect image of a, a Razor, uh, Motorola Razor V3. Um, yeah, perfect. On point, on point. Um, yeah, the icon of the flip phone era, indeed, triple halt, uh, definitely. Um, I guess we've got one more here. Oh yeah, this is great. Okay, let's throw this up. Um, yeah, someone's barbecue tongs idea. Um, so these are cool because you, like, what is the advantage of doing this over CAD? And the goal, and I wouldn't say I'm here, is that you can do these faster than you can CAD something up. So you can get ideas down. This is sort of like, you know, this is like the quick quick sketch to communicate something. Uh, and then if you actually want to go and make it, then you go to CAD. But you can do, you know, 10 of these in the time it will take you to make one CAD sketch. So... <clears throat> definitely, definitely uh, some value to be had there. Um, yeah. Um, let's see what else we got here. Um, This is an interesting question. Um, Akash the Bloop says, I work as an ML researcher at a cancer hospital. Cool. And we recently got a high school intern who joined our team. I want to make sure she has a great learning experience with us, but I'm not quite sure how to go about it. Do I have any experience working with teaching inexperienced workers in technical roles? Um, a little bit. Um, I um, have had various helpers in the shop over, well, since pandemic started, who were like high school age, high, middle school and high school age. Um, and uh, at least two of the kids that were um, uh, in the family that I was staying on the, on the Native American reservation, and then one of the other um, high school kids um, uh, who lives on the res. And, uh, you know, it's been kind of a mixed experience. I think it depends a lot on what their interest and aptitude and ability to sort of work on directed is. Um, but I would say like, I would say that one of the key things for like an intern, um, in my opinion, is really giving them space to learn, which gives them, which means giving them space to do some amount of struggling and some amount of failing um, and something that's going to be challenging to them but finding that right level of challenge, right? You you don't want to have them fetching coffee. You know, that's not really what internships are about. I'm sure you know that and are on that page already um, by the fact that you're asking this question. Uh, but you also don't want to give them, you know, a completely, you know, blue sky project and send them off, you know, with no direction. Uh, so, you know, what I've done, um, I've actually got someone helping me out um, here who's been um, fabricating various things for me. Uh, he built a, um, a, uh, a, a stand, he welded a stand for my Starlink dish. Um, and now he's working on putting some shops, uh, some shelves in the shop downstairs um, is to sort of talk through, okay, this is, this is what I want you to do. This is how I want you to, this, these are the steps that I would take. Um, and then kind of turning him loose and letting him struggle on his own for a bit and then kind of coming back and checking in and saying, okay, how are you doing stuff? Um, or thing. Uh, I, because I'm having him fabricate things, I'm starting with draw it on paper, take your measurements of whatever you need to take. And then um, I'm having him learn SketchUp because uh, I think that's easier for a beginner to learn than Fusion 360. And it kind of goes well with this type of fabrication, these types of things, because everything's like right angles. Uh, more complex things um, or have more flowy shapes. I think Fusion 360 is a much better uh, option or if you need, you need to be really precise um, and have lots of constraints on things. 
Um, and he's really struggling with SketchUp. He's, I mean, he's getting there, but it, it's taking multiple days to do simple um, SketchUp drawings. Uh, and then once he's got that, I'm having him turn those into um, like blueprints, um, you know, physical drawings that he can print out and take in the shop with him and then going through the steps on, on making things. Um, and uh, that's been good. That's, that's worked really well. I think it's key. I think those check-ins are key in giving enough structure so that they're not just floundering, um, but also not having the expectation that they are going to be as efficient as someone who um, is experienced in that role, you know, whatever you're having them do, right? They're, you know, expect like a quarter to a half efficiency, right? Um, and just being okay with that. And and part of how I'm making it work with, with him is I'm just paying him by the project. So, you know, it takes him however long it's gonna take him. I pay him what I think is fair for the project. Um, you know, what I would pay someone else who was a little bit more experienced. And, uh, and then he, then we don't have to worry about, you know, how much is he spending time learning? How much is he spending time floundering? That kind of thing. Um, so, um, I think that works out well. Um, yeah. Um, Akira says, yeah, make sure the team understands he is not there for coffee runs. So no one takes advantage. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's really key. Um, and to really focus on, on it being a learning role rather than just a helper. Um, you know, I think that's really key. Um, so, uh, and then Skaver Hat, apparently as me says, uh, also always make sure that they know that they can ask questions. Yes, this is huge. Um, lots of people are, are. Um, have trouble asking for help or clarifying when they when they're interning. Yeah, totally. Um, I 100% agree with that. And yeah, I think you have to normalize the idea that they're not going to know everything, um, that they're going to have questions, and um, that they're going to struggle. And that struggling is okay, but only up to a point. You know, you don't want someone just sitting there banging their head against the wall for days. You do want them doing it for an hour or two. You know, because um, that's how we learn. And I don't. I don't know. It sounds like you've got like she's going to be working with you on ML, hopefully. Hopefully she's not just tagging data or something for you. Um, and uh, um, so, yeah, uh, I think that's key. The other thing, and maybe this is specific to my situation, but maybe it, in some way it's applicable to you, is I always tell people that work in my shop, particularly young people that work in my shop, if you break something, it's not a problem. I have a budget for breaking stuff. I break stuff. Um, you know, uh, the, I'm not going to be mad at you for breaking something. You know, I hope that you treat my tools and, and the shop well, and the materials here well. Um, and if you're not treating them well, then we'll have a discussion. But, um, what is a problem is if you break something and you don't tell me, right? If you break a tool and then I go to use it and it's broken and I have to wait for parts or wait for a new tool, that's the problem. Right. So if you tell me right away, hey, Scotty, I think I broke this. Um, we can order a new one. No harm, no foul. Right. Um, yeah. Same thing go with goes with getting hurt. You know, don't cover that up. Um, yeah. Uh, Sako says, adding on to that, interns asking questions is not only expected, but desired. Don't feel like you're annoying the manager. You're asking. The fact that you're asking questions means they know you're doing your work. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I would, certainly wouldn't set up the dynamic of like, you know, you have to check in with me to, for me to know that that you're doing your work, right? Um, obviously, you should be managing to the point that you do know, but, um, but yeah, um, really set up the expectations that that uh, that questions are expected. Yeah. Um, so Akash follows up and says, um, of course, that's kind of why we we're struggling to really give enough to the students so they don't walk away hating the field either because it was too easy or too, too difficult. Yeah, um, I definitely think that's the right question to be asking here. And, and part of that can come from the student is like, you know, giving them options of like, well, I have this type of project or task. I have this kind of project or task, you know, give them a couple options. What sounds most interesting, you know, and be ready to switch it up, you know. Um, Again, I think the goal isn't to get as much work out of them as you can. The goal is to help them learn as much as you can and, and have a good experience. And probably in the process, you'll get more work out of them. <laughs> you know, it'll it'll work towards everyone's goals. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and 
I mean, Akira follows up by saying, yeah, I'm not sure that should be a concern. You really need to show the reality of the field if they hate it, they hate it. Yeah, totally. But you don't want someone to hate the field just because they were struggling or just because they were given menial tasks, right? So um, I think we're all on the same page there. Um, all right, uh, let's do another show and tell here. Um, we have, we have, we have, let me get the right images up here. Cool thing from Triple Halt. So let me get this up on the screen here. So Triple Halt says, I started falling down the rabbit hole of tech repair YouTube content and felt an inkling to do a restoration uplift for an old Game Boy Color among my favorite handheld consoles. I had I didn't have a Game Boy Color. I had an original Game Boy back in the day, shortly after they came out, and I loved that thing. It was awesome. Um, never really played with a color. Uh, so I found one on eBay, fully functional, luckily enough, and did a shell swap plus backlit, uh, plus backlit LCD mod. And I think it turned out really cool. Bonus, uh, touch sensitive pads on the top for brightness and color palette control. That is pretty awesome. That's very cool. So the clear shell is probably the new one. Is that right? I know that like modding Game Boy is a big thing. Oh, I wish we could see the uh, touchscreen. Yeah, I'm assuming that this is the new one over here. Very cool. That's awesome, Triple Hall. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I, I I think like oh man, hanging out with Matt um, from Small Change Arcade when we did the the slot machine ATM, he made me. He helped me appreciate exactly how deep the like arcade game, console game rabbit hole goes. And uh, if, if you didn't see um, two weeks ago on the show and tell, Professor Tops showed off his incredible uh, his incredible Pokemon lab. So, I mean, the rabbit hole just goes really deep here. This is awesome. This is very, very cool. Um, yeah, you can get the sticker here for uh, repair. Very cool. Awesome. How much did this, if you're still in here, um, oh, you are. Uh, so you say clear shell is the new one, correct? Say build teal one since the screen is technically, so technically functional. Awesome. Um, how much did this cost you out of curiosity? I'm curious what this runs. Oh, we have a raid. Hello, hello. Welcome, raid. We are showing off a cool mod, cool case swap by uh, Triple Halt here. Welcome to Strange Park Show and Tell. Um, this is, uh, we're live every Saturday at uh, noon Pacific. Uh, and um, this is a time for uh, myself and other members of the Strange Parts community to show off cool projects we're working on. So um, this is a project that uh, um, Triple Halt uh, has submitted. Um, which is a, a case swap to a clear case for an old Game Boy Color. Um, here's the here's the front, uh, and um, I guess it has uh, touch sensitive buttons for controlling um, the new backlit LCD screen, um, controlling the brightness and, and color tint of that. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, and if anyone would like to show off. Uh, be part of the show and tell, you're welcome, even if you're not a member of the Strange Parts community. Uh, if you think it's something that a geeky technical audience would be interested in, um, whether it's electronics or whether it's uh, you know manufacturing or it's your home workshop or it's 3D printing or anything along those lines, um, Arduino, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, you're, you're welcome to. The the link is here. I don't know. Someone was saying it. Maybe it's not on screen. It's strangeparts.com slash show and tell. Um, and we'll have a mod get you up here. You can either be on live with me on the on the stream and have your face on stream. Or uh, or um, you can just send in pictures. Or you can just uh, point your camera at your thing and we can talk about it live. And you don't have to show your face. So um, welcome, welcome. Uh, what all have you been doing uh, over in... Uh, Popo Nut Land. I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with Popo Nut. So, um, fill me in. 
Yeah. And then, of course, uh, come hang out with us on the Strange Parts Discord. Yeah. I do not want you to point your thing at the webcam, Sako. I mean, point your webcam at the project you want to show off. Oh, nice. Popo Nut does uh, a bit of everything, mainly arts and crafts. Screams. I assume that's streams. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Um, what were you working on on this stream? I am curious. Uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with Strange Parts, um, this is the Strange Parts workshop. Um, this is where I work. It's a two-floor garage workshop. And... Uh, Strange Parts started as a YouTube channel, um, and it still is a YouTube channel, where I do things like modify iPhones. Um, I built my own iPhone from scratch from parts I bought in the electronics markets in Shenzhen. I actually started the channel when I was living in, in China full-time, uh, more or less full-time, coming and going. And uh, I also do things like go inside factories and show how things are really made, uh, doing factory tours. Um, everything from circuit boards to um, giant laser cutters that cut metal an inch thick to all sorts of things. Um, so, uh, this stream was gaming. Awesome. Awesome. What game were you guys playing? Um, <laughs> crafting also devolves into scream sometimes. Absolutely. Um, nice. Sako says he has more things to show off, but he might leave it for another week. Awesome. Um, you're, uh, you showing us your $300 resistor was awesome uh, two weeks ago. So definitely want to see what you're up to. And your, your crazy um, phone mod or uh, a mouse mod. Um, yeah. Red the Tech just started a 3D printing business selling printed items. What You might not want to say, and I respect if you don't, but what kind of things are you showing Red the Tech? I'm kind of curious. Um, even if you just give sort of like a really broad category. Sometimes people are a little bit, um, they don't want to say exactly what they're selling because someone else can come in and just sort of snipe that market if they know that they're making money. So yeah, but I'm kind of curious. Um, Knickknacks mostly. Okay, cool. I've seen people, like, I don't know how much money they're making, but I have seen people on, like, eBay selling 3D printed, like, brackets and things. Very specific for, like, a very specific model of, like, wood router or something. Um, and selling them around the, like, $20 price point, which, you know, if you can actually sell a decent number of them, could be a pretty good business. Um, oh, nice. Sako says uh, he's got a VFD watch which is a vacuum fluorescent display. Very cool, like green um, display. Lauren, where is it? I have one sitting on the shelf that I've never fired up. Someone sent me this. Um, I did a video getting a vacuum uh, VFD to work, but this is a giant one that I think are, I think each of these is essentially a pixel um, from a uh, giant like display at uh, a sports stadium. Um, and you can see, like, that's where the the glass was pinched off to make the vacuum. Um, it's it's really a kind of a wild thing. Um, I forget who sent this to me. I'm sorry if you're listening. <coughs> but it's very cool. I wish I wrote on it who sent it to me. Um, it's got, like, a mirror on the back. It's kind of wild. Um, well, Sako, we look forward to seeing your VFD watch and updates on your voltmeter project and your soldering iron. Yeah. Um, Red the tech says, yeah, uh, finding actual customers is the hard part. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's the hard part of every business. Um, you know, even even uh, making content, right? Uh, if your customers are your viewers, right? Um, it's a matter of finding something that uh, people want um, that isn't already uh, being done uh, as well as you can do it. So, yeah. Yeah, or finding finding things they want to buy, I think, is the more important part. Absolutely. Um, you know, we in the startup world, we talked about product market fit, right? Um, what is the product that the market wants? And the market doesn't always know. They might know that they have a problem, but they not might not know what the solution looks like. So, yeah. Um, 
Awesome. Well, let's see what else we got going on here. Um, I don't think we have anybody signed up just yet. Again, if anybody wants to sign up, um, jump in. That's kind of the end of our list for today. Um, but maybe I can show some things off. Let me see what I got. Um, I have some secret things sitting here. Oh, I have something that we can show. I got a present from Carl. Um, Carl Bugaj? Um, if a mod can find his channel, that would be awesome. I think it's B U G A J, or maybe the other way around. Um, uh, I first met him, I ran across him on Hackaday IO, which is the like Hackaday project site where anybody can post their projects. Um, and then, um, met him in person at uh, Hackaday Supercon. And he does some amazing things with electricity. He's a very creative um, maker, um, hacker. Uh, where are the things he sent me? So he recently did a video about making a self-soldering circuit board. And, um, you know, I left a comment just saying, oh, this is so cool, Carl. And um, and he said, uh, he said, well, if you want to try one, let me know. And I said, yeah, I want to try one. Or I said, I might have to try it. And he said, well, let me know what you need. Um, uh, and he had some extra, um, boards and some extra components. And so this is the board here and it doesn't, let's see if I can focus on this. Oops. So it doesn't look like a whole lot. I mean, it just looks like a normal circuit board. Um, it's called open reflow and it has a thermal in over here and a thermal out. And these are just, you know, plus and minus voltage. Um, now it also has, um, so it has a bunch of components on here. And the idea is that you solder the first one of these semi-manually. And then the next one, he sent me two boards. The next one, the thermal in here gets hooked up to the thermal out of this board. Now what's happening here? Let me refocus the camera. So what he has done is he's used a four layer board, right? So there are the two outer layers here and here. And then in the middle, he's made a serpentine uh, trace, right? Uh, a strip of copper, right? That uh, when you apply enough voltage, heats up just like a a heating coil and say like a um, a heated blanket, for instance, right? Uh, and the idea is that you apply your solder paste, which is tiny microscopic bottles of solder suspended in flux. Um, and and solder is just um, uh, lead and tin, a mixture of lead and tin, right? That melts at a reasonably low temperature. So you apply it here with a uh, stencil, right? This is all normal how you would make electronics like this, right? So he sent me a stencil, uh, which is super generous of him. Shout out to Carl for being awesome. Um, let's see if I can get this open. Here. Okay, so this is what a stencil looks like here, right? Um, let's see if I can focus. So you you line up your board behind here, right? You, you, you get this all lined up and you squeegee solder paste onto the board. And so you're left with solder paste on just the silver pads here, right? And then you place all your components. This is a normal way you do it. And then normally you'd stick this in either an oven or you'd use your hot air gun to melt all the solder. Uh, but what Carl has come up with is because of that serpentine trace that hooks up to these two thermal in pads here, you could just apply voltage to the board and the board will heat itself up. And then uh, all of this circuitry is designed so that you can hook up a thermocouple, which can measure temperature, so that when you're soldering a second board, you can hook the thermocouple up to the board, place the thermocouple on the board, I think it goes on the back, and you can measure the temperature. And so the sort of parent board can do all of your temperature monitoring and can do an exact temperature curve that is 
specified by the solder manufacturer usually or the component manufacturer of like you know you should be at this you know you should ramp up this quickly to this temperature and then stay there for a while and then quickly bump up to this other temperature and then cool off right um and uh and so the idea is that this is sort of like rep wrap uh in the sense that one board once you've soldered one you can make additional boards using this board which is so it's self-replicating in some sense uh which is just super cool and so you do the first one just with your benchtop power supply and you measure the temperature yourself with a with a thermocouple i've got i can plug a thermocouple into my multimeter um so super 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 cool um i don't have all of the components that i need he sent me a bunch of leftover components he had um but uh i think i have to order a few so i can't do that today um but uh yeah the this should be very cool um machine yearning asks isn't it usually recommended to apply heat to both the pad and the component to avoid cold solder joints wouldn't this apply heat only to the pad um i think that's definitely the argument if you're using an iron the reality is in a reflow oven you would be kind of applying heat to both and i think with the components being so close to the surface of the board, I can't imagine it's gonna be an issue, right? There's there's a fair amount of contact between the solder and then the solder and the component. I, I think you're probably fine. Um, that's an interesting question though. Hey, my secure gift, how's it going? Um, <laughs> Sako, oops, Sako says, uh, Reminds me of my business cards. Um, do I have any left? And I think those are just one floating here. Yes, this is. Oh, this is from the the laser cutter video we did. Um, this is actually one we cut on a laser just to see how that would, would look. Um, does not look anywhere near as good as the etched ones. Uh, I do have, I have a bunch of them left. Uh, I technically give them away at uh, events that I go to. So for any of you that haven't seen, these are what my business cards look like. Um, and uh, we made a video going inside the factory in China that made these. I thought they were going to use lasers to cut this out and etch this. It's got a QR code on the back. Um, you can scan if you want. Um, visible as possible but uh yeah the they don't etch these with a laser surprisingly um they etch them with chemicals just like you would a pcb they look very similar to a pcb line um the biggest difference was i think there might be a they were using a different etching chemical it's possible um but also just less accuracy right you don't have to be as accurate with uh business card uh, as you do with a, a PCB, you know, uh, not as quite as small details. So yeah. Um, oh, hey, Box Kid, we haven't seen you in a while. Good to have you here. Oh, and, and we did find, I might be pronouncing his name wrong, Carl Bugeja. I, I didn't realize there was a, an A on the end. But yeah, please go subscribe to Carl if you're not already. Um, if you're into electronic stuff, he's just doing really amazing things. Um, for a long time, he was playing with uh, flexible circuits and making them action to like motors and mechanical flappers and all sorts of things um, using kind of like a solenoid concept. So you'd have like a magnet or or two coils, and then you have a coil that would, would create a magnetic field and push away. Um, really cool stuff, which is how I originally found him. Um, I was just kind of hunting around for inspiration and ran across his stuff and I was like, wow. Um, but now he's moving on to other really amazing, innovative concepts. Like nobody is doing this. Um, this is, uh, very, very awesome. I, nobody I know I've heard of anyway. So, um, and, uh, pretty sure it's open source based on the open, <laughs> the, the open and the open reflow name. So very exciting. Um, yeah. Um, and then, uh, it looks like Scave Rat threw up a link, I'm assuming, to, to Carl here. So you can go find that in the chat. Um, yeah, um, really awesome guy. 
So um, maybe on a future stream, we'll try these out. Uh, I, I would like to try these. And this seems like a reasonable forum for it. Um, yeah. And then if you're into electronics, the the place to be, if you're into to designing your own electronics, at, you know, as a hobby, even if you do it professionally or whether or not you do it professionally, um, the Hackaday Supercon conference in November is the place to be. Uh, it's very small. It's 500 people. And it is the who's who of the electronics maker world. So, excuse me, um, you know, people that I see there are like Mike from Mike's Electric and, um, uh, oh, um, I'm trying to think of creators that you've heard of. Um, um, Joe Grand, who's not really a big like YouTube creator or anything, but I think Joe was part of Loft back in the day. Um, the, the hacker group um, it does amazing things, um, kind of more security. Sammy Hamkar, um, uh, Merlin from um, Hackster IO. Uh, yeah, I, just awesome. I'm sure I'm forgetting like a gazillion people I should be mentioning, but um, yeah, great, great, great conference. My favorite. So I'm, I try and make it there every year. I gave a talk this past year on uh, storytelling for hackers. So how to how to make videos like I do. So probably going to turn that into a more formal thing at some point here. But um, you can go find that video online. Um, yeah. Uh, what else we got here? <laughs> this is from a previous conversation, but maybe when the first iPhone comes with no ports, I should put one back. Yeah. I've actually thought about making one with no ports. <laughs> uh, I think it's pretty doable at this point. But. Um, you'd have to figure out uh, how to unlock it would be the main issue. Um, but maybe we could figure something out. Um, uh, I should make a foldable iPad mini. Maybe. Maybe. I want to get back to the foldable iPhone. I know that there's a Chinese guy that pulled off a pretty credible foldable iPhone. So um, that's pretty awesome. Um, Excuse me, sorry, I'm still a little sick. I, I got a cold beginning of last week. And, uh, still a little bit congested here, so I apologize for my sniffling. Um, unfortunately, I don't have an easy mute button, so you all have to listen to my gurgling. Um, what else we got here? My secure gift is working on designing an LED stage light. Awesome. I actually thought I was going to be a uh, lighting designer for theater um, when I was in high school and, and part of college. Um, I really enjoyed uh, theater. And then I did my first professional internship. Actually, this is super relevant to the internship conversation. I did my first professional internship and they treated us terribly. And um, I burnt out uh, and um, hated it and uh, realized that, fairly or unfairly, realized I didn't like the the commercial side of theater. I didn't like, you know, I was working in a summer stock theater, uh, Berkshire Theater Festival in Stockbridge, and they had bad management, and they were asking us to do unsafe things and work crazy hours and, and then yelling at us. You know, I, they would have us be in the air. When we were doing a changeover between shows, they'd have us be in the air, um, you know, all night, and then go back and get a few hours of sleep and then come be a board operator. And I couldn't think straight when I was that sleep deprived. And so I would make mistakes and then I would get yelled at. So, um, so yeah, that, that's what, what switched me over to, to having a career in technology. Um, probably all for the best, but, um, I've definitely made more as an engineer than I ever would have as a lighting designer, but, uh, I do miss it. I do occasionally dream of, uh, you know, helping out a local theater company or something. How do I heat the shop during the winter? So I don't know if you can hear the the noise from it, but um, back in this corner here, there's a gas heater. Um, and so that, I've got that hooked up. It's a little wall unit and then, and the, it's forced air. And then uh, I've got that hooked up to a uh, Nest thermostat. And so that turns it on in the morning and then off at night. Um, uh, 
so it's always warm in here up upstairs downstairs i leave cold um there's no gas heater down there uh but i've got two electric um space heaters uh that i can run down there if i'm planning on working down there so um works out pretty well um it's very comfy up here i usually keep it on the warm side um just because i often shoot in a t-shirt and stuff um helps me with continuity and uh and then um uh if i go work downstairs like sometimes i throw on a jacket or uh i just if i think about it in time i'll turn on the heaters a couple hours early so yeah um i should add a magsafe to connect her to an iphone um yeah, it's an interesting thought. There actually are third-party ways to do that. There are these. Do I have one? That'd be a fun thing to show up. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, there are third-party things that can do this. Let's see if I can find one here. I have one floating around for a while. I don't know what bin it's in. Tables here. Um, I don't know. I thought it was one of these red cables, but I don't know where it is. But um, there are cables you can get that have like a little bitty plug that plugs into, say, the bottom of your. You know, you can get them in Lightning, micro USB, and USB C, right? But they would plug in here, and then they stick out a little bit, and they just have a flat surface. And that's a mag MagSafe like connector that then the cable plugs into, and you get the, the connector and the cable together. I wish I knew where it is because it's a cool little thing. Um, I bought a bunch. I got excited about them. I bought a bunch, and then really didn't end up using them very much. So. And I don't really know why. I mean, one reason is they don't really stay connected super well. Like, particularly with a phone, if you're like picking it up while it's charging, it's really easy to knock the cable off. Um, so, yeah. Um, but there are options out there. You can get them. They're not very much money. Um, yeah. Let's see. Oop. I always have. Uh... Oh, sweet. Skabrat's going to get us a photo here of what I'm talking about. Um, read the text says I, I had one from a bad company, had the loose magnet issue. Yeah. I mean, part of me just wonders if you just can't cram enough magnet into that small space. Um, yeah, I wish I knew where mine was. Anyway, uh, let's see if we can bring up an image. Oh yeah, just working on it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Going back to the previous conversation, yelling at interns is crazy. Whoops. Um, yeah, it, it was really nuts. It was really, yeah, kind of an abusive environment, so. Live and learn, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it was nuts. And to be clear, I wasn't even being paid. I was being paid room and board. So I was an unpaid intern that was getting yelled at, uh, working crazy hours and then getting yelled at for being sleep deprived. So awesome. All right, let's see if we can find a picture of these connectors. Not yet. Um, when we find it, shoot me a message, Skate Rat, when you find one. Um, it all started with a Kickstarter scam? Really? All right, I'll, I'm going to look this up. Snaps. Snaps. The $9 magnetic adapter for your mobile devices by Snaps. That's, uh, screen share here. Snaps. Yeah, this is, oh, this is interesting. This is slightly different from what I've seen in the markets. So it looks like you, it's just these two pieces. Wait, hang on. Sorry. I thought I had this image up. I don't. Okay. So 
This looks similar to what I've seen in the markets, but not the same. Um, these, it looks like they're selling just these two pieces here, and then you use your stock connector. Um, in the markets, this part is integrated into the cable. So this piece is all one piece. Um, and then you have your ends. Um, and at least the lady I was talking to, I was literally just buying from a booth in the markets. Um, I got excited about them one time when we found them with some people I was showing around the markets and we all bought a bunch and she was thrilled. Um, but you would buy a cable and you would just specify what end you wanted with the cable. So you, it was kind of one-to-one. -one. Um, wow, they raised a ton of money, several million dollars. How is this a scam though? This looks totally manufacturable. I'm very curious what happened with this. They have 30,000 comments. <laughs> I guess people didn't receive their products. People demanding refunds. Wow, as recently as 16 hours ago. When did this product launch? Because I bought these like a couple of years ago. Oh, this is 2015. Awesome. Yeah. So this is probably totally the inspiration for that. Um, the markets are, are great about finding good ideas on things like Kickstarter and figuring out how to make them, make them effectively and more cheaply, which is actually, so I used, when I started the channel in Shenzhen, I was hanging out with a bunch of open source hardware hackers, uh, a loose group of people. We were going to have Chinese barbecue and beer together. And it was kind of a, a loose conglomeration of folks uh, led by Ian Lesnet um, from Dangerous Prototypes. Amazing guy, kind of paved the way for a lot of us to come to Shenzhen um, and really sort of provided uh, a lot of advice and, and sort of how to get your feet wet. Um, and uh, Ian, um, Ian had this theory, I think it was Ian's, somebody in that group, I'm pretty sure it was Ian, had the idea that, that if you're going to do a Kickstarter and you don't have a manufacturing background, the best thing to do is to make a very successful Kickstarter like this one and wait for, so you, you run your Kickstarter and then when your Kickstarter ends, you just fly to Shenzhen and you look for copies of your thing in the markets. And it, this would be the perfect thing to do it with. And then you figure out who the manufacturer is that has copied you. You find the best one and you go and partner with them and you say, Hey, like, I know you're already making this. I want you to be the official manufacturer for this. And then you work out some split where they can like sell your thing in China, but maybe not to the U S or something like that. Right. And you work out because they have basically already proven to you that they can make the thing. And maybe you need to make a few changes here or there but they've already chosen they can execute. And it's where a lot of Kickstarters get jammed up is they don't know anything about the manufacturing piece. And it's something that, that Chinese factories are great with. Uh, and you've already tested them out, right? You have no risk at that point because the reality is even if you don't partner with them, they're still going to be making and selling your thing. <laughs> so, you know, it's not like you're, you're enabling them in any way. Um, and you've just reduced your manufacturing risk from a ton to, you know, slightly above zero. So, um, yeah, so supposedly we've got, oh, uh, I think Steve Rat added a photo of his, um, oops, his magnetic charger here. Hang on. Let me see if I can bring this up. Sorry, I have to switch which tab I'm sharing. Apparently I can share more than one tab. Okay, so this is the thing here. Yeah, this is exactly what I found. Um, uh, so this little white end here has a couple little pogo pins. So pogo pins, you can see in things like MagSafe connectors, they're little spring-loaded contacts. Um, and they originally were used as, and they, they um, are still used as connectors for test jigs in a factory. So you'd you'd create these test jigs that are called like bed of nails. Maybe if a, a mod can find an image for this, that'd be great. Um, but it's a bunch of pogo pins sticking up like this. And then you have like a, a jig, you have some locating pins and you put a circuit board on top of it and the pogo pins touch contact points on there and then you kind of clamp it down. 
And it's a very quick way to like make electrical connections with um, test points on a board uh, for programming or testing or whatever. Um, but they've started been using connectors ever since um, you know the original MagSafe. Uh, and so this is the little end that goes in the device, um, USB-C, micro USB, or, or lightning, and then the cable just snaps on there. So um, cool stuff. Yeah, hopefully we can get a picture of better nails here. Um, yeah. Hey, ED4, welcome. Um, sorry, I'm behind on chat here. Read the text says, um, I thought about making a Pogo charging dock for my tab eight. Yeah, totally. So Pogo pins. Um, uh, how do I get a Chinese manufacturer for my product? Uh, so the way I just described is one, um, but it's kind of a broader, broader question. Uh, the best, the very best way to do it is to go to China, right? And meet with manufacturers. But I think the broader question is, well, how do I know who to meet with, right? Um, and, and if I'm not gonna go to China, how do I find one? Um, I think a good starting point is to look on Alibaba for, for a small manufacturer, unless you're planning on doing a very large initial production run, which if you're asking this question, you're not. <laughs> um, the best thing to do is to find someone, find a manufacturer on Alibaba who is already making the thing that is closest to what you want to make as possible, right? Um, because it shows that they already know how to do it. Uh, and then, you know, in some scenarios, it can be as simple as white labeling a product. They've already got a product that they, they can fully manufacture that you tell them to change the color and, you know, print a new logo on, right? That happens a lot. Um, and then you start selling it as your product. Uh, another way, you know, that can get more involved of like, okay, let's change the case design and so on. The advantage to white labeling is it's much faster to get up and running and it's much cheaper. Um, a, a manufacturer is going to charge you NRE, um, which is, uh, I think it's non-recurring engineering cost. And NRE is things like, we had to figure out how to manufacture this. We had to make tooling for it. So we had to make molds or some other sort of dye or something, right? Uh, you know, all that, any sort of R&D they have to do, anything, that all gets lumped into NRE. And NRE is, is a cost that's independent of how many units you want to make, right? Uh, and, and usually, like, the cost for units will be something like, you know, manufacturers will do like uh, the cost of all of the ingredients, all the components, which will be your bill of materials, your bomb. Um, they'll do bomb cost plus 20% or something, right? And I, I don't, 20% might be wrong, it might be more than that, but, um, you know, they'll do a cost plus model. Um, but NRE is just like whatever NRE is, right? It might be, you know, well, you've got a $4,000 mold, right? Um, uh, or a $10,000 mold or a $100,000 mold. If you have a really big product, right? Um, it's not uncommon to spend six figures US on tooling um, for products. So if you're starting with a white label product, that tooling already exists. Now, if you want to change the shape of it, you might have to make new tooling and that really bumps up the cost. Uh, so those are all things to factor in. The other thing I would say, um, you know, this is a very broad topic that we could talk all day about, but I would say, one of the things that I learned um, from all of the people that I hung out with in China, but particularly Greg from Rev Robotics, is the most important thing to working with a Chinese manufacturer is the relationship. You need to be friends with your suppliers and like friends, friends with your suppliers. You need to meet them face to face. You need to go have, you know, a meal together, go have beer together, go sing karaoke together, right? Building that relationship is far more important than having a signed contract. Um, stuff comes up in manufacturing relationships and 
the typical sort of Chinese approach to negotiation is it's an ongoing negotiation for the length of the relationship, not nego you know, Americans sort of negotiate until you have a contract and you write everything in the contract and that's what everybody sticks to. And it's more fluid in China and it, it, there are pros and cons to both, right? You know, the Chinese model is like, well, if there were unexpected things that came up that we didn't discuss at the beginning, you know, things, things were more difficult or more expensive than we thought, then we changed the agreement. We worked together. Um, but by being friends, you know, in, in China, you don't screw your friends. It's okay to screw over someone you don't know, but if you've got a close relationship with someone, you don't screw over your friend. Um, and also, um, the other thing that sort of helps secure things is you want to have an ongoing relationship. So you don't, ideally, you don't want to be going to a manufacturer and saying, I'm only going to make a hundred of these ever, right? Um, you don't want to lie, but you want to create a situation where there's going to be an ongoing win-win relationship between you. So if this product goes well, I'm going to order more, or if this product goes well, I'm going to do a new version and grow the company. You want, you want them to see you as a long-term business partner and not just a one-time customer. So some tips, um, we could talk all day about this. Um, yeah, at some point I'm gonna jump into manufacturing my own product and I'm sure I will have lots of lessons to share with you. Um, if you wanna learn more about manufacturing in China um, and hear some amazing, hilarious stories of how it can go wrong, uh, go check out um, Jesse's blog on keyboard.io, keyboard.io. Um, I think it's, I think that's right. Um, anyway, if you search for keyboard IO, you'll find him. Uh, he's had quite the quite the hell of a story. He he actually had um, a manufacturer he was working with making custom keyboards. The sales lady was running running a scam. Uh, the, the 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 overseas sales lady. The the factory was legit, and the sales lady was crazy and was doing all sorts of shenanigans, which is kind of giving away the the story. But it's. Yeah, he's had some amazing experiences and it talks very openly about, about Chinese manufacturing. So, um, it sounds like we have a picture of some pogo pins here. Yes, perfect. So this is a bed of nails jig. This is a real like close up. Um, these pins are quite, quite small, but uh, you can see the pins underneath here. These are all spring loaded, right? Uh, and they're, they're have a wire soldered onto the back or connected on the back. Um, so each of these is one, you know, one contact to somewhere on the board, right? And often there are these like circular test pads. And if you look at a, a commercial product um, circuit board, they're often, you often just find these bare circles, right? That are, you know, gold colored uh, usually or silver colored. Uh, and that's where the pogo pins would attach. And then kind of like the mounting holes on the board might be used for locator pins, which are just steel pins that that um, sit in those holes to make sure everything's lined up. And then you have some sort of um, like clamp or something on the top that presses down on this. Um, and these are custom made for each product. You know, they're, they're made off the design of the circuit board and uh, are used for, for testing and programming on the factory line. What's interesting is particularly when doing small quantities, um, often the, the customer has to be very involved in things like the programming and testing jigs. Um, whether it's making it yourself or whether it's like really closely working with the factory, factory might make the test jig for you, but you make what hooks up to the test jig, right? Cause it's gonna be really specific to your product. So you might write all the test routines and things like that, um, which is something that I never really thought about um, prior, to, prior to spending lots of time in, in factories in China. Um, and, uh, you know, typically you might only make one or two test jigs. They're often, you know, made by hand. They're kind of cobbled together. They have to have like a raspberry Pi or something inside and running them. And, and what you want is you want a test jig that has like, you put a board in, you clamp it down, you hit go, and it gives you either a green light or a red light. <laughs> either this board passes or it fails, <laughs> you know, um, and maybe a diagnostic code, but you want it to be really, really simple for those factory line workers because they're just trying to go as quickly as possible. Right. So you want to make it really really easy um, and really obvious as to, you know, go, no go, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> is this a real head up here on the shelf? Uh, no, that is Homeless Elvis. This was a commercial product um, a while back. Uh, someone gave this to me at Supercon. Uh, it is an animatronic Elvis head and I've been dragging it around with me. Um, it's been in storage for a while. So it's, it's a looking a little bit ratty. Um, but, uh, the, I, the thing has a bunch of servos in it that can, 
move the head around and it can sing and it can curl its lip like Elvis does. And uh, so my my plan is to hook it up to the Alexa that's sitting right next to it um, up here and have it be the face of Alexa or Alexa be the voice of Elvis. So, um, yeah. Oh, here's the um, keyboard I.O. blog here that I was talking about. And yeah, Sako, Sako says like, yeah, these pogo pin test boards are typically t handmade. And, um, you know, they might route the plate to get the dimensions right, you know, on a CNC router. But yeah, they're, they're all assembled by hand. Because for each product, you'll need one or two. You only need one per, per assembly line, right? So for small product runs, you're making one. Maybe two if you have one sort of in your lab in the States and one in the factory. Excuse me. Um, Mobile Chaos has a question about making an iPhone camera modular so I can stream TikTok from the bottom of the phone for my Lego set streams. Yeah, I do recall seeing that somewhere. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to reply. Um, possible, yes. You basically need to make a flex cable that has the right connector on it. So it has a female on one end and a male on the other for extending that camera uh, module. Um, totally possible. Don't know if you can buy it commercially. You might hunt on AliExpress or Alibaba. Um, otherwise, not a super difficult project. You're actually the second person to mention this to me. Um, the first one was a um, a virtual character streamer. I know there's a word for that, and I can't think of it right now. But basically, they have like a motion capture setup, and it captures uh the performer and then there's like a virtual uh character on stream um and there's a really popular one whose name i can't think of so somebody in chat's got my back here um vtuber that's the word i'm thinking of and oh, i can't think of the really popular one that everybody knows uh but anyway this this vtuber wanted to extend the camera for like a facial tracking rig um so, but I don't know. They had weird ideas of what the word collab means um, when it comes to videos. Um, I think they interpreted it as collabs are where the other person does all of the work uh, and you get something custom made for free, which is not my idea of how collabs work. Um, they, weren't, they weren't very interested in the collaborative part of collab. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, still talking about uh, pogo pins. Um, that even though the pressure for one is very tiny, it adds up. And if you have a bunch, then it takes a lot of force. Oh, that's interesting. I haven't actually played with a lot of pogo pin test jigs. I've seen them, but I didn't realize that. It makes sense, though. Um, yeah. Sako says a fun story about the red light green light system is that there was a manufacturer who had many reject boards go into retail because the workers weren't told to do when the light was red. So they just talked, to, yeah. Yep, this is a really typical story, particularly for small manufacturing, um, super typical. Like, and this is why, again, I say, go to China, visit your manufacturer, spend time in the factory. Like all the guys that I know that are doing small production runs successfully are spending weeks in the factory getting their production run set up, um, particularly for the first one. Uh, because it's simple things like this where you think, oh, this is obvious, and it it just isn't, right? If someone someone grew up on a farm and is working in a factory for the first time, like they may not understand that green means good and red, right? Uh, in China, red is a good color, so you know it's a lucky color. So yeah, it's you know it seems obvious, and yet this is this is sort of the the challenge, I think, with Chinese manufacturing, right? If you did American manufacturer, maybe you wouldn't have this problem as much, right? Although uh, I went and visited um, Keysight uh, and they they had some similar challenges. They said one of the challenges in their manufacturing areas, they, you know, contractors don't necessarily have computers at home. Um, 
and and they're just here in Colorado. And uh, and so they said, you know, they had they were using a bunch of computer based systems, um, and they said it was really challenging for their workers. And so they moved actually back to sort of physical like whiteboards and and paper systems because it was easier for people to to navigate. So, you know, still an issue. Like there's a huge human factors element to manufacturing. And it was Code Miko that I was thinking of. Thank you, PRPX, um, who's a friend from China. Cheers. A German friend from China that I met in China. Anyway, the very first trip I went to China. Yeah, so, um, yeah, if you're looking for pogo pins, uh, Adafruit is a place. I'm sure they're way overpriced. Um, pogo pins are bizarrely hard to find, um, or they used to be anyway. Um, so, yeah. They're kind of a weird niche product. What else we got here? Hmm. Uh, so, Dr. Fartatun says uh, X versus O would be better. And Scape Rat points out, even that's not consistent across cultures. So, yeah, I mean, we make a lot of cultural assumptions, right? Here's a great assumption. In the US, we expect that everybody knows how to how a credit card works. Chinese people don't use credit cards. They use WeChat, WePay. So, you know, if you have a credit card product, you might be making a bunch of assumptions about how they think it should work versus what they actually know about it. So, uh, yeah, things to things to keep in mind. Um, Yes, I still have stuff in a storage unit in China. I'm hoping I'll get it back in a couple months here. But yeah, the goal is probably to stick it in a, in a shipping container um, and have it shipped over to the US. Because um, I, don't, I don't see myself living full-time in China again. And I don't need that stuff there anymore. Um, and it's really expensive to store it. It's more expensive for that storage unit than it, would, than it was for my uh, same size storage unit in San Francisco. So go figure. Um, I, I have a feeling storage units are much less of a thing in China, so it's kind of catering to to Westerners. Um, Dashi says, uh, "Don't you think all phones look the same today?" I saw my old Xiaomi A1 the other day, and it felt like something new. Um, interesting. I don't know what a Xiaomi A1 looks like. Um, uh, Xiaomi. I mean, I do think phones all kind of look the same. And I, I'm not convinced that it's because it, it's the perfect for it, you know, because it's perfect. Um, so much as, I don't know, there's a lot of innovation. Um, yeah, I don't know how old this phone is, but I would believe that it just came out. Like, let's see if we can figure it out. Oh, 2022. Wait, what? That's new. I don't understand. How is that an old phone for you? Am I misunderstanding? <laughs> so Scape Rat, this is actually what I was going to talk about next. Scape Rat completely round one, and that exists. So my friend, um, oh crap, what is her name? Totally blanking. But uh, the Circle phone, C-Y-R, her name? I'm feeling really bad now. Uh, I just saw her at Hagaday Supercon. Um, but she made the circle phone, which is not quite round. It's it's a little bit oval shaped um, because of the camera, I believe. Um, what is her name? Let's see. Team. 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 Open link. Christina. Yes. So um, Christina's a friend. Um, how do we see a bigger picture here? So yeah, this is the circle phone. I believe you can buy these right now. Um, and yeah, it's she's she has amazing manufacturing stories as well. Um, trying to get this made. Um, she's doing really, you know, fairly small run. She's not a big phone manufacturer, you know, it's just a, a few folks, and uh it's been a saga. Uh, um, you know, everything from sourcing parts to manufacturing to supply chain issues to um, 
you know, dealing with, you know, they had to make some significant changes to Android to get it to run in a circular window. So, uh, but I think it's pretty cool. Like uh, it's a little device. I don't own one, but I've held one and um, they're pretty awesome. Yeah. So really, really cool. Um, one of the big issues with this is uh, certification because it's, it's a cell phone. So it has to have um, uh, certification. So she's had to jump through a lot of hoops to, to get it certified. Um, huge pain. But um, huge props to her and, and her team for, for doing this. Um, very, very cool. Yeah. Um, are we going to do a local meetup? Maybe a local Discord chat? Yeah, I, I've been thinking about doing a meetup at some point. Um, it just hasn't risen to the top of the priority list yet. Um, you know, there's just only so many hours in a week and I'm still using them on all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah. Um, but I'll, something I'll consider, are you local? We might have exchanged messages and I'm just not remembering. So my apologies. Um, anyway, um, Oh, maybe maybe I was looking at the wrong Xiaomi, the Mi Five X. Xiaomi. Xiaomi. Mi A One. Okay, not the Red Mi. Man, they are. There we go. I think this is what we're talking about. Okay, in 2017. Okay, this makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a little bit of a different look, but we still got this, this like very defined form factor, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, eventually we're just going to have like, you know, solid glass rectangles with no features on them, you know, that are just these shiny black rectangles with rounded corners, you know, no buttons. Um, I don't know. I think it's time for someone to spice things up, even if it's slightly less functional. You know, I think the folding phones are cool. I wish they uh, were a little bit more robust, but it's still early, early days as far as that, as that stuff goes. So, someone's bringing up the haptic knob project by Scott. Bez one, I vaguely remember this. Let me see if I can find it. Um, haptic knob. Bez one. On the GitHub. Let's see if I can find a picture. Yes. Okay. So let me bring this up. Yeah. So this was this crazy like. Let me open this. Okay, let's see if this. This is the Smart Knob View, an open source DIY input device that explores haptic features. Is there a way for me to add a YouTube video? Notations, background music. Oh, that's how we do our music. That's nice to know. Share a local video file. Here, wait, hang on. Is there. Because you guys aren't hearing this audio, I bet. Um. Anyway. Uh, I'll, I'll get that figured out later, but basically like it's this knob that does all sorts of incredible things. So you, the outside is twistable. The center is a screen and you can twist the knob, but also it has a motor to control it. And then I think it's touch enabled. Um, and you can do things like the knob can move itself, I think, and it can push back against you. Um, it's been a while since I've seen this, but maybe somebody else can, can fill it in. Um, oh, audio worked. Okay, wait, let me play it. Hang on, sorry. Audio works when you share tabs. Software defined end stop. This is too a smart loud or too quiet. An open source DIY input device that explores haptic oh, feedback okay. technology. Had sound. Fault state. It's. It this the first is time. the smart knob. Let's try it. This is the smart knob view. An open source DIY what input the, device that heck? explores haptic <laughs> feedback it, technology. It worked before. In its default state, it's a smooth um, rotary encoder with a round LCD and some RGB LEDs. 
Internally, it uses low-cost strain gauge sensors Are you guys hearing quick the audio? lower vibration to emulate oh, the tactile feedback of pressing a button. Okay, wait. Let me let me start over because I, I can't. Here's the cool <laughs> part. The knob. This okay. is the Smart Knob View, an open-source DIY input device that explores haptic feedback technology. In its default state, it's a smooth rotary encoder with a round LCD and some RGB LEDs. Internally, it uses low-cost strain gauge sensors and a quick motor vibration to emulate the tactile feedback of pressing a button. So this is like the haptic touch on... on Here's the cool part. The knob is actually mounted to a brushless DC motor, which allows the device to selectively resist motion, creating software configurable end stops. This is the cool part. <laughs> because these are software-defined end stops, we can easily make them support multiple full revolutions which would otherwise oh, awesome. be tricky to implement purely mechanically. So it can rotate multi multiple times and then give you haptic feedback on a stop. That's cool. We can also implement virtual snap points using the motor, like this simple on-off switch. The motor provides resistance until you pass the center point, creating a, really a satisfying snap when you cross it. Video too. Or if we define a single snap point, we get a spring-loaded knob that I That's so cool! I remember running this across this. This is implemented one. using a high-resolution magnetic encoder chip, allowing for single-degree resolution one. for fine-grained control. And we can enable virtual detents to provide haptic feedback to match this high resolution. Oh, it's clicky. Why is nobody commercially making Of course, this? since this is all software-defined, we can dynamically change the size and granularity of those detents, making them coarser, yeah, I remember seeing this. It's been a while. This is so awesome. When was this made? And we again. can always go oh, back wow. to that buttery made. smooth limitless rotation. This is just scratching the surface of what's possible with relatively inexpensive parts and hobbyist grade tools. Make sure you're subscribed if you want to see more about how this Shout out to Scott and Bez. Works, and check out subscribe. the description for links to the open source project. Thanks for watching. Uh, mods, let's put the, the link in the chat here so people can go check this out and um, go subscribe to Scott Bez. Um, what else has he been doing? Because this is just an incredible project. Okay, so we've got some smart sm smart knob stuff. Tiny Nintendo Switch with a working screen. That's pretty cool. Yeah, go check out Scott. Scott, awesome. Yeah, that's super, super cool. Let me just go back to a shot of the knob as we talk about it here. Just let this play again as we're chatting. I'm sure there's questions and things about this. Yeah, racing wheels do the same. I just went, <laughs> you're all going to laugh at me. I just went to a micro center for the very first time, like last week, uh, and um, got to play with a $1,400 racing wheel, um, which was bananas. Yeah, like crazy strong force feedback and stuff. But um, yeah, this is impressive in such a small form factor. Um, Box Kid said he wants to replace his doorknob with it. Um, totally. Um, but yeah, you could absolutely make this into a combo lock, uh, a digital combo lock. That would be pretty awesome. Um, yeah, at some point, a company is going to start making these. I'm surprised they're not already. Um, yeah, I mean, this is just a beautiful, beautiful project. Gorgeous. And uh, here's here's Scott's YouTube channel. So just uh, if you search for Scott Bez One or at Scott Bez One, youtube.com slash at Scott Bez One, or uh, and then this is his uh, GitHub. So same thing. And it's in the chat. Yeah, you could use this for so many things. I mean, this would be great for things like, um, like they have consoles for custom-made consoles for color adjustments um, for video, for doing uh, color grading. And uh, I can see this being used for like your RGB values or your, you know, your, 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 your uh, I mean, heck, like if you had three of these knobs, you could use them for all sorts of things, right? You could use them for your, 
your brightness versus your shadows versus your highlights. You know, um, a lot of those control surfaces have things like um, trackballs, which are interesting. I've never actually played with one, but they look cool. I don't do enough color grading. I, I'm not good at color grading, it turns out. <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> I've tried to learn. So um, so the guy my editor do, and we don't shoot uh, log video anymore because it's just too hard to grade. So um, yeah, awesome, awesome project. Well, that's about it for today, unless there's anything I'm missing here. Um, thank you all for tuning in. This has been awesome. Um, would love to have some more folks sign up for Show and Tell next week. So if you're watching this and have something um, you're, you'd like to show off or are willing to show off, it doesn't have to be finished. You don't have to have your face on camera if you don't want to, but you're welcome to. Um, you can show us just, just the thing. Um, and uh, you would love to have you, or you can just submit pictures of it. And I'm happy to chat about it with you on stream, uh, or I'm happy to just react to it on stream. Um, yeah, go to strangeparts.com slash show and tell. Um, it's just a little little form, just tells us uh, a little bit about you and, and uh, what you want to show off. And uh, everybody's welcome. Don't, don't feel like, you know, you're not good enough to be on the stream. So um, we'd, we'd love to have you. Uh, and yeah, again, this is, uh, every week, um, at, uh, noon Pacific time, uh, 1 PM mountain, um, come join us in the discord. Uh, it's where we all hang out, uh, in between streams. So, uh, I'm there almost every day and, um, try and, and respond to anybody who pings me in there. Um, and everybody, uh, you know, all the regulars that, that hang out on, uh, that are in the chat right now. And uh, everybody that's that's shown something uh, is on Discord, and so there's there's plenty of opportunity to talk about these projects as well as uh, everything else. You know, there's there's tons more projects that people are showing off on Discord and asking questions and getting help, and I'm in there getting help and asking questions and showing what I'm working on. So uh, come hang out with us. And then the last thing, I'll just give a quick shout out uh, to um, uh, if you'd like to support Street Parts, the best way to do it is to sign up on Patreon. Uh, and that money is really not going to me personally, but it's going towards me hiring um, some some other team members to work with me on Strange Parts so we can put out more content, um, whether that's more live streams, more videos, um, more projects, more awesome things. So um, Patreon's a great place. Uh, Twitch, not so much. Um, if you want the badge, go for it. But, uh, but only half of that money goes towards Strange Parts. Uh, the other half goes to Twitch. Um, whereas Patreon is, it's a uh, 90% goes, goes to strange parts. And so it really is kind of, you know, if your goal is to, to make it so I can do more with strange parts, um, it's kind of double the bang for your buck. Um, of course, if you're subscribing with, uh, Amazon prime on Twitch, welcome that it's essentially free money. So, um, and again, it just, it just goes towards paying additional people. I'm hiring for two positions right now. I'm hiring a camera operator editor to work with me here in the studio in Colorado and then um, a uh, travel and production coordinator to work with me on factory tours all over the world. Um, and that person can live anywhere, um, but they need to be an American citizen and have an American passport. So um, just keep visa visas simple. So um, yeah, uh, if you'd like to learn more about those positions, if you sound like a good fit, you can go to strangeparts.com slash jobs. And I have job postings for both of those there. Or if you're just curious, um, go for it. Yeah, we're actively interviewing for those, hoping to hire someone here in the next few weeks. So, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for tuning in. This has been awesome. A little bit, a little bit more low-key than uh, previous weeks, but, uh, but uh, awesome nonetheless. I'm glad to see all of you. And, uh, yeah. Um, hope to see you again next week. Uh, and, again, if you want to show something off, um, please, uh, please add yourself to the list. So um, the link is here. So with that, I'm going to sign off and uh, go try out, go try out the hot tub that I finally got working last night. So uh, have a good weekend, y'all, and I'll see you on Discord. Take care.